So, Adam, thanks for joining us to talk about your film, Blackwoods. It's quite all right. First question. Can mm. you give us a brief synopsis of the film? Okay. Uh, well, the story is about uh, a guy called Ben Marshall, who is a university professor. And um, he his marriage and his relationship with his family is broken down because he's overworked and you realise that there's been some breakdown in his... Um, mm. you know, he's, he's, he's had some sort of a mental breakdown in the past. So he, um, he takes it upon himself to relocate his family, step back from his work and um, start afresh. So he, um, he moves away from Oxford, out towards Wales, and uh, moves into this beautiful old house which is going to be a fixer-upper. <laughs> and uh, makes this promise to his family that whatever happens, from now on everything's going to be fine and they're all going to make it work. Um, but after being there for a few days he starts to realise that he's, he's seeing visions of uh, a woman and child and given his fragile state of mind he doesn't want to start alerting his family to what's going on because he's not quite sure if it's in his mind or whether it's in the house and uh, he takes it upon himself to begin this uh, investigation into what these occurrences might be and the, de the deeper he digs he's, the more sinister explanations he turns up and it becomes a, a story about one man's obsession with trying to get to the bottom of the truth where did you start with this idea? Because obviously it's, it's yourself and J.S. Hill who wrote it. Um, where did it all start? You know, what was the initial idea? Well, um, I've been working with Joe who wrote the film and a guy called Adam Marin Griffiths who's the producer. We've been working, the three of us together, for a long time developing various scripts. And um, we started talking about uh, what would be great as a first film and we realised that Quite often, it's great to have a film where, if you've got limited resources, it's great to have something where it's quite contained. As a director, you can use things where it's not about the big spectacle; it's about creating the mood and the atmosphere and the the, uh, the tension, because that that's cheap to <laughs> achieve, really, because it's about planting something in the audience's mind. So we started talking about doing a supernatural thriller, and because you can't compete with. Uh, you know, the, the bigger spectacle stuff that comes out of Hollywood. I think the one thing that the UK has got in abundance is uh, atmospheric countryside and eerie, eerie locales and uh, lovely old houses where, you know, they're very unique to the UK and there's a long heritage of the UK ghost story. So we said, well, look, let's, let's try and make our own um, old school ghost film, you know, ghost or paranormal thriller. And we've, we've all, uh, you know, we, we particularly love a lot of the films from the 70s where they're, they're more like psychological horror, where it's more about what's in the, the protagonist's mind as opposed to seeing, um, you know, seeing uh, the threat on the screen. So there was no inkling at all about doing fan footage? We talked about things like that. Funny enough, we've actually developed a script which um, started out as a fan footage film because I, I think it's it's um, you know it's, it's an ever popular genre, and it is. And at one stage, we did talk about going <clears throat> fast and loose into shooting the film, doing it in quite a scrappy, quick guerrilla shoot sort of way, given that we didn't have a lot of money. But I'd say my tastes. I really like things where they feel like. Uh, some time has been spent trying to compose them and they feel like they've been storyboarded and uh, getting away from that kind of faster kinetic editing style that you see a lot these days so it was a deliberate move to do something which felt a bit more old school and a bit more period in some respects I really like those films where the, the audience is invited to sort of uh, linger on the frame a little longer and you get to uh, sort of wallow in the shots, so um, we deliberately went the other way and tried to make it quite cinematic and tried to go quite widescreen and shot it anamorphically and thought, well, it's almost the opposite end of the spectrum from the found footage genre. <laughs> I'm pleased you didn't go found footage, there's so many out there and they just keep turning out, you know, you're talking about six a week or something like that now, mm. so it's nice, as you said, it's nice to see something that reflects the old school, really. You were talking about locations. Where did you film it? Because, I mean, the house is, as you said, creepy, 
but beautiful. It's so nice. So I was just wondering where you'd filmed it all and the, the wooded area and everything. <laughs> I think with something like this, you um, when 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 we started talking about the, um, the 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 idea of the Blackwood House, it was going to be such a character in the film. It really was important that we only committed to making the film once we found the right sort of location. And I, from my point of view as a director, I always like to work backwards. I like to find a location and then work out how we can explore it and do what we need to do in the house. And uh, we spent a long time travelling up and down the country. We were looking up in Yorkshire. We talked about doing it in Wales and Cumbria and the Cotswolds. And um, I was spending a lot of my weekends just travelling around, just randomly sticking pins in the map, trying to look for places where there might be atmospheric locations. And in the end, I actually stumbled across it on the internet. And luckily, this place was just in Surrey. So, so as soon as we found this place, everything came together because we thought, okay, we don't have a lot of money, we can transport the crew from London to Surrey and back again every day, we don't have to put everybody up in hotels. And this house that we found, it was, um, it was, a, it was a really beautiful old uh, arts and craft house, I believe designed by a guy called Voisey, who was um, an architect who did, you know, build lots of these uh, sort of iconic houses, where they're, they're, they're very atmospheric and they're very unique to the UK, you don't really see them elsewhere, but they, uh, there's something beautiful and quite homely about it, but at the same time, you turn the lights off and start lighting it the right way, it suddenly becomes an atmospheric creepy house. And I think with, a lot of the, with, with something like this, you want something where, you, when the moment they step through the door, you don't think, right, they're just walking in some terrifying old house, but equally, you don't want something that is so warm and cosy that it doesn't feel like you're stepping into that ghost story world. The the forest area, the woods and everything, was that attached to the house or is that a separate area? They were all nearby. They, a lot of those places we found down in Surrey again. We, um, we found some great forests down that way. We, we actually ended up finding a private forest where we could go down there and do some of the filming, but I was really surprised. I thought you'd have to go much further out of London to find ancient woodlands, and actually around Surrey and the uh, the South Downs, there's really nice gnarly old trees. And because of the time of the year we shot it, everything was dead, and there was bracken everywhere, and moss, and sort of uh, you woke up in the morning and there was ice and mist, and it was it was really perfect for us. Um, and we also um, to kind of pad it out and really make it feel like it was. Um, further afield. We ended up doing a, two, a couple of days shooting in Wales as well, so a lot of the big wide um, countryside shots were around the Bracken Beacons in that area as well. How long did it take you to film overall? I mean, what was, where did you start and what was the finale for you? Do you as you said, you know, you worked backwards, you were do, finding the location and then you decided, right, let's make the story. Did you do that with filming or how, how was your process? Well, with the filming, we ended up shooting for about 32 days, which for a low-budget film is, is quite generous. Uh, but we found that we needed to, um, because we needed to take a lot of the crew and cast from London, and, uh, and there was a lot of travel time, we were doing quite short filming days. And we were filming in the depths of winter, so the big challenge was trying to work around daylight hours, because about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, it was dark. So you had to sometimes, sometimes at night time you were having to push lights through the house to make it look like it was daytime, and sometimes during the daytime you're having to black out the windows and make it look like nighttime. So that was a big challenge. And we also had, um, we had a three week uh, filming period in the house just before Christmas. So we had to shoot everything out in one go. And because of the nature of the way we were filming, we didn't have the luxury of having trailers or any anywhere outside the house. I think if you were doing it with a bigger budget, what you would do is you'd create a production village and then have the house as a whole life set. But our house really was our whole production office as well. So we, every time you swung a camera around, you'd suddenly see the, the wardrobe department and you'd see the <laughs> ED department. And it was just, there were tracks everywhere. So it was very, you had to think very um, tactically about how you would shoot around the house. So we would almost shoot one room out at a time which, from a directing point of view, it meant that your head was all over the place. And, it, and for the actors, it was really confusing. Sometimes you'd be shooting the very last scene in the film, and then 
you, they do a bit of costume change and it might be the first time they've walked in through the front door. So trying to get the actors backwards and forwards into that headspace when it's quite complex <laughs> was, was a real challenge. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, th this cast that you've got, I mean, you keep talking about it being a low-budget cast, but I don't think it is. I mean, Ed Stobbard, Russell Tovey, Sophia Miles, who I, every time I see this woman, gets better and better as well. Where did you get them all from? How did you convince them to turn... Because you're saying it's a low-budget. I don't think it is. How did you convince them all to turn up? The story is that um, because I've been working in TV for a long time, I've been working with various people along, across the years, and when we started making the film, uh, the producer said, look, we need to put, a, uh, you, you know, put a, a line in the sand and say, this is when we're shooting the film, and then just tell people what's happening and see what happens. So it was all, it all happened very, very quickly. So I reached out to the people that I've worked with before, uh, like Paul Kay and Russell, uh, and Ed Stoppard, and they, uh, we thought, wouldn't it be fantastic if I could bring people on board that I've worked with before? So they very kindly um, jumped on board our little project. And with Sophia and Greg, I think Adam had met Greg Wise uh, in the past. Sophia, we'd never met before, but she, she came on board literally a few days before we started shooting. It was all very, very last minute. I was looking at going into my first shoot day and half the cast wasn't really in place. It was a, it was a very last minute experience. But I was, from my point of view as a director, I was very lucky because I wanted to try and work with people that I already knew I had a good working relationship with because there was going, it was going to be a challenge just trying to make the film anyway. But um, I felt we did very well with the cast. I feel, I feel really lucky that these people came on board. And actually, they, they, um, I think together as a team, they all, they all work together very, very well. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I was so surprised when I started watching it that the, more and more just kept turning up. And, <laughs> you know, it, it was just so surprising to see, as you keep saying, you know, there's low budget, and yet there's quality actors here. This is a thing. Um, when you'd finally seen the film, when it had finished and everything like that, what was your reaction? I think when you see the film for the first time, you know, I, I, I think as a director, you never feel like you've ever seen it through a fresh pair of eyes because you live with it so long in the edit. It's a very strange experience. I did a very long cut, which was over two hours, and sat down and watched that with the temp score. And, and that, I guess, was my first experience of seeing the film as a whole. And I, I, was, I was genuinely pleased with it. I really think that given that we had... Um, we, we, I, I think the, we... we, we exceeded the expectations of what we were going to do with it. Uh, I think there's always things that you'd like to change. There's, uh, you, you, you always want to have everything perfect as a director. There's, you always analyse scenes. And some, some days it feels like everything's gone your way and you really feel like the scenes exceeded your expectations, but then there's other days where maybe time gets in the way or weather or just bought very boring, dull logistics sort of limit. Uh, the you limit what what you could achieve on the day. Um, so I won't flag what those scenes are, but there's a few where I wish I could have gone back in and tweaked them. But I think that's always the nature of it. I think now I've had a few months stepping back from it. I can watch it afresh and feel like more like an audience member as opposed to the person who's watched it 500 times. <laughs> How long did it take you to narrow it down from the two-hour cut down to obviously what's what's out now? Well, um, we got to a first cut quite quickly. Within about six or seven weeks, we had our first cut of the film. Uh, I think because a lot of the film was tightly storyboarded, I tried to just shoot what I felt I really needed. So there were only so many options as to how the film went together. Um, but after we got to that first cut, we realised that there were things that we wanted to change, and then we probably spent another six weeks then going back in and experimenting, moving scenes around. That was a big thing for me, is that... Just because it's written in the script a certain way doesn't mean that it has to exist that way in the edit. So we started learning that by actually moving chunks of the film around, it had an impact on what you were informing the audience. And sometimes it's about not telling the audience too much as well. We we shot uh, we shot a lot of um, see uh, there, there was a bit of a B plot about standing stones and things like that. But actually, we started trying to explain too much, and sometimes it's best to kind of hold back and just leave things a bit more ambiguous. You were talking earlier about your 
the way that you liked older films, you know, the ones that built up the tension and everything like that. Mm. And I, I think in this, there's lots and lots of influences that we can see, which obviously you've grown up with and everything. So what were some of those influences and what are some of your favourite old school horror films? I mean, we're talking about, you know, before <laughs> before the era of digital art stuff. Yeah. I, well, I, I really like... Um... I do enjoy a lot of the older films from the 70s and 80s. Uh, we've always talked about Don't Look Now and The Shining has been references, things like Rosemary's Baby. Um, I, I, th I think as well, back in that era, everyone was using these lovely old wide-angle anamorphic lenses as well. And there was, a, there was less of a tendency to, to cut and perhaps go a little bit wider with your shots. So rather than sort of cutting through the action, it was more about trying to keep the storytelling quite fluid and moving the camera and letting things move within the frame rather than trying to do it all through cutting. Um, but in terms of influences, um, I'd say um, I, I always, you, you know, my, my big number one fan is Spielberg uh, <laughs> in a lot of respects. And I really like his early films like Jaws and uh, uh, I thought it was always so powerful how he used the sound design and holding back on showing, you know, sh showing the shark. Not, I, I know he ended up doing that as a, a that became a device because he was working to limitations. But I think uh, a lot of filmmakers have run with that in later later years. They, they've, they've appreciated that it's not always about trying to show everything and trying to keep things a little bit slower and just holding back. Did you take any um, influences from real life ghost stories when you were starting it out? Did you look at certain <coughs> bits and listen to stories and read books and everything like that? Did you take some of that? I've, I've always loved ghost stories. I, I grew up in a... Haven't we all though? This is the thing. <laughs> you know, as soon as the lights go out, you instantly think, I'm scared, but it's kind of fun. It's just, it's something about things that get into your imagination. I think it's almost that wanting to feel like there's something extra in the world, isn't there? The, you know, is that, whether it be magic or something paranormal, it's, it's, it's almost like hunting the idea that things aren't quite as, as mundane as they seem, but maybe there's something special lurking around the corner. And for me as a kid growing up, I, I lived in a big farmhouse in Yorkshire, on the Pennines. It was very remote, there was very little to do, it was, wasn't, my childhood was, uh, when I see Harry, the little boy in the film, I really relate to him because there's a lot of scenes where he's going off and exploring the woodlands and that was me growing up really you just make your own entertainment you just go explore and it felt that because you had this endless expanse of space um, even though it was very free you almost felt like it was very restrictive because there was nowhere to really go do you know what I mean there's like no civilization nearby but in terms of ghost stories um, I um, I think just living in this big old house it always stirred my imagination. We had a big attic and there was a basement and at night time all the floorboards were used to expand and contract as the central heating went on so the house always made very weird noises and that. I'm, I'm sure that stuff has all stayed with me as I've grown up. Uh, but yes, I, 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 think, I think people do enjoy those sort of films. I think uh, it's, there's always an appetite for a, an old fashioned scare. You're, I mean you're talking about things that go bump in the night effectively but there isn't that many in this film is there you you know you keep building the tension and, uh, and did you purposely decide right we're not going to do these bumps in the night we're just going to keep building this until it gets to a finale which is what we want it to be I think so we um it was interesting we had um at one stage we had a lot more uh sort of shock moments but uh, and uh, they were devices to try and scare the audience, but we we started to feel that it, 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 trying to go too heavy-handed or too on the nose with stuff wasn't really working for the film, and we we wanted to try and keep it more of a uh, perhaps go a little subtler with it because of the the nature of the film and where it goes. It's trying to uh, play with the conventions of the genre and some of the tropes, maybe things that you recognise from. Uh, ghost stories that have gone before and then try and play with it and subvert it a little bit so that by the time he gets to the end of the film he goes off in a surprising direction where everything that you've been led to believe 
so far perhaps isn't quite what you've read into the film. What should we take away from the film? This is the thing, you know, should, should we be... Should we come out and go, I jumped a couple of times? Or do you think we should be constantly thinking about it a little bit more? And when we do go to Great Grandma's house that's out in the woods, we'll think, hang on, is this Blackwoods? <laughs> um, well, I, I think... It, when, when, we made, when we made the film, we were talking about uh, the, the scares coming from two places. It comes from the par paranormal aspects and the thing, things that might go bump in the night. It's also the fear of um, the physical threats to the family and the idea of the family breaking down and a lot of psychological threats as well. So it's, it, I would say it's somewhere between a ghost story and a more psychological horror uh, or thriller where it's, uh, a lot of it is about... It's, it's sometimes saying that it's not necessarily the things that go bump in the night that you want to be worrying about, it's the things close to home. It's, uh, you know, it's the family members and the, uh, the pe people living down the road that perhaps you want to be worried about. You kind of think that it only happens in Hollywood movies, but in actual fact it doesn't. As you said, it happens down the road. Yeah, well, I think, it, I think that's true. I think... Um, you open the papers every day of the week, don't you, and you hear about quite <laughs> horrendous stuff happening within family dynamics. And um, I think when we sat down to write the film, we tried to make these characters quite complex and a little bit, um, a little bit feisty, where you weren't quite sure where your allegiance was going with the characters. You weren't quite sure. It, uh, Ed, Ed, who's the protagonist, wants to have it so that you are rooting for him, but at a point within the film, he almost like runs away from you as the audience, and you start to, your allegiance starts to go move to the other characters within the film, and you start questioning who has, you know, who has the right moral compass. Yeah, that's exactly what I did, and pleased you said that. I was thinking, oh, maybe it's just me, but um, just, just one final question, really. Um, What's next for you? Are you staying in horror, or are you looking at other areas? We've been developing some other horror films. So uh, Joe has been busy writing a couple of other scripts. He's got some great horror ideas. I think we'd always like to keep working in that field. But we've uh, we've written a thriller called The Mandrake Experiment, and it's a 1970s-inspired thr uh, paranoid thriller, uh, but it's set modern day in Singapore. And um, it's uh, we 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 like films like Three Days of Condor, The Manchurian Candidate, The Ipcris Files, those sort of films about uh, the little man, uh, you, you know, the man's being manipulated by the government and bigger corporations. Um, so we it looks like we found the money for the film. It would be on a bigger scale, and we'd be shooting it overseas later in the year if it all uh, goes ahead. So it's a, from our point of view, it's a, it's a huge step up. This was a film that was almost going to happen uh, three or four years ago, and we were very close to it happening, and for various reasons it didn't, through, you know, uh, finance not quite coming through. Uh, and then we went off and made Blackwood, Blackwood, but because we've made this film, this has now helped us find the money for the next project. So it's been a, it's been a really interesting um, progression, going from the short films to making Blackwood to the next feature film. It, I, I always find that there is a progression between people who make horror films and then slowly move into this thriller area anyway because there, there's no there's no fine line there's no definitive line it is I would say pretty much as the same box really I think so I think thriller and horror it's all about trying to raise the audience's pulse isn't it it's about trying to give them their the, the sort of heightened moments of jeopardy and fear, anxiety, all those things, and uh, uh, quite often with a horror or paranormal film, it's about the mystery, it's about the, 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 the greater, you know, the bigger secret within the film. And uh, I'd say it's the same for thrillers, it's really about the chase, isn't it, and trying to explore who it is who's pulling the strings. Brilliant. Uh, many thanks for joining us, Adam, and telling us about Blackwood. It's quite all right. My pleasure. Good talking to you, Mark. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.